We opened our doors for business in London over 40 years ago, and we're still trading on the same values now as we did then. Professional, dedicated, and trusted. We are the Miko Group. We've had the question quite a bit in the relatively recent past uh, from assureds and clients of what happens when they reach a settlement uh, in evidence by an exchange of emails, for example, where there's no law and jurisdiction clause in that agreement. How do they proceed against the defaulting counterparty where they fail to honour the agreement? That was exactly the point that was raised before Mr Justice Mayles recently in the case of the Four Island, um, that case uh, was on the Aspatankvoy form and the law and jurisdiction clause that was agreed between owners and charterers in that case stated that all and any differences and disputes of whatsoever nature arising out of the charter shall be determined uh, under London Arbitration English Law. Um, the tribunal was therefore asked by the owners to rule, to award, on the basis that the sum agreed w was the sum now due and owing and an arbitration award needed to be published accordingly. The charterers said, well, hang on, that, that can't be right the disputes which have arisen arise out of the settlement agreement and not out of the charter party and therefore any proceedings must be under the settlement agreement which had no law and jurisdiction clause and they brought an application therefore under section 67 before Mr Justice Mayles on the basis that the tribunal had no jurisdiction to award accordingly. Mr Justice Mayles acknowledged that Section 67 of the Arbitration Act applications require a rehearing rather than just consideration of the jurisdiction position. But having considered carefully um, the exchanges, he agreed with the arbitration tribunal that actually the law and jurisdiction clause of the Charter Party was sufficiently wide to embrace differences and disputes arising subsequently and therefore um, he agreed that the owners were in a position to proceed under English law and London arbitration pursuant to the settlement agreement. Interestingly, Mr Justice Mayles found that the words settlement agreement were a rather grandiose term and that essentially the exchange of emails um, culminating in the settlement was nothing more than an agreement of sums due and owing under the charter party and therefore it was a conclusion of charter party um, debt um, which he felt, um, in addition, was enough to bring the, um, the owners within the law and jurisdiction clause of the Charter Party. It's a little dangerous decision on one level, though, and we would strongly recommend clients and assureds to take our advice before reaching these ad hoc deals where insufficient consideration has been given to what terms are incorporated, not least... Um, the law and jurisdiction clause and, and how they should proceed in the event of a counterparty default. So it, it's a salutary uh, reminder that we recommend clients and assureds to always consult but on, on another level it's also an indication of the thinking of the court that where the settlement, where the law and jurisdiction clause is widely framed and the, the exchanges are informal, such as, for example, enabling Mr Justice Mills to conclude that here we've got a settlement of sums due under the, uh, due under the charter party, then that may be, uh, may be sufficient. 
in conclusion, beware, however, it, it's, it may not be as straightforward. And this is a case before Ireland, very much on its facts. Overall, clients and assureds should always seek advice on such points.